Back then, when I was still a high school student and a member of the student Christian movement, we used to sing a hymn, I have wandered far away from God. I'm, now I'm coming home. The path of sin is too long. I have for too long I have trod. Lord, I'm coming home. His chorus repeatedly said, coming home, coming home, nevermore to roam. Open wide the arms of love. Lord, I'm coming home. I had joined the student Christian movement because of the faith of my mother, Mrs. Agnes Staffa, who held the Bible with high regard. On the Sabbath day, my mother would take a break from all work, sit under the tree, reading the Bible. When my elder sister, Pauline Opadube went to high school and became a member of student Christian movement and, and began to profess her own Christian faith, my mother spoke glowingly of her. She was so proud of her, so much so that I predetermined that when I get to high school, I will also join the student Christian movement, accept the Christian faith to make my mother proud of me. And so I did, a fact that brought me to the whole life of biblical studies while my elder sister pursued science. It was the faith of my mother, the faith of many African women and millions of other women in the world that brings us to faith. And so during those years as a teenager at high school, we used to sing the above hymn repeatedly, repent, and reconcile ourselves to our Creator. Although it is unclear to me now what we knew about sin and repentance, I think now more than ever we need to interrogate our alienation from God the Creator. Now more than ever we need to interrogate ourselves about the path of sin that we have long walked upon. Now more than ever we need to interrogate ourselves about coming home. The very act of coming home involves movement, crossing multiple boundaries, encountering new realities, and getting dislocated in the edge to come home. And yet this also brings us many other complex questions as we ask, what is home? Where is home? When do we know we have arrived home? And what if we find home a strange and unwelcoming place? These questions are critical to us today as people of faith, those who identify with the divine power and who seek to be consistent with the will of God, the creator, wherever we have been placed upon Mother Earth. These questions are critical for us as we seek to reflect on power, agency, and the mission of God, a scholar-practitioner conversation. In this paper, I seek to contribute to this theme by using the case study of the circle of concerned African women theologians' work and the vision they provide for us for understanding and carrying out the mission of God. My discussion will be under the following order First, coming home, I will look at the history of concerned African women theologians, mapping out their research uh, themes, looking at the mission of God and the context and scriptures they use. I'll look at agency itself and power. I'll interrogate what is the mission of God using the scriptures of Genesis 1, Luke 4, 16 to 22, and Mark 5, 21 to 43. In conclusion, I'll return back to the theme of coming home to God's beautiful earth. To start with, coming home.
the history of the settle of African women theologians. In 1989, 1669, African women gathered at Trinity Theological Seminary in Legon, Accra in Ghana, under the leadership of Mercy Amba Oduyoye. She had spent more than a decade searching for women in religion or theology, be it in the academy or faith spaces or both. Oduyoye had noticed that while women were dominant members in religious gatherings and cultural practices, they were hardly there in the leadership of faith institutions and academic departments of religion. African bishops, archbishops, priests, deacons, professors, and academic doctors of religion were largely men. The church was a strange home for women. The absence of women from both the academic theological space and the leadership space of believers had consequences for the lives of women and the girl children. Male-generated interpretations of cultures and scriptures were often used to oppress, exploit, and keep, keep women in their patriarchally designated spaces. Occupying the space of marginalization, silence, and disempowered, women were not only unwelcome strangers in their faith homes, but they were also denied their God-given agency. They that were created by the creator God, they that are made in God's image, have been empowered and have been given agentic power to speak, to create, to lead, to empower others. For God has put God's self seal upon them and upon their bodies. Yet as African women were discovering, they were bound by the sin of patriarchy, among others, that silence and deny them their God-given rights as people who are created in God's image. In response, Mercy Amba Oduyoye, a Ghanaian woman who was of a Methodist background, gathered other African women from almost every country and from all, almost all religions and cultures and from the diaspora to challenge and to change this scenario. It was a process of walking away from the path of sin, characterized by the launch of a transformative African female intelligentsia space with a clear agenda. The quest was to generate a theology that embraces and empowers all genders. In her words, Oduye wanted a theology that flies with both wings, an inclusive theology, one that includes and empowers all people. Women from all religions and cultures were thus invited to enter the space of researching, reading, interpreting uh, scriptures and cultural texts for interrogating and exposing oppressive aspects, as well as to generate liberating interpretations that affirm all members of the earth community. The circle was thus launched in 1989 with a clear agenda for women to research, read, interpret, write, and publish in the area of cultural and religious texts for, for liberation and empowerment of women in particular and the whole earth community. Since women in religion were seriously lacking, to build capacity through mentoring became an important strategy for building the capacity of women in the academy and in the leadership of faith institutions. According to Isabel Piri, the circle is a community of African women theologians who have come together to reflect on what it means to them to be women of faith within their experiences of religion and culture, politics and structures in Africa. She highlights that from the onset, the circle was 
and inclu was inclusive in its membership and on the type of theology it produced. African women were defined as women who belong to the diverse classes, races, cultures, nationalities, and religions found on the African continent and its diaspora. This also meant bringing women from different religions found in the African continent. Piri further underlines that the settler's very existence is a protest against exclusion and discrimination in faith communities and society as a whole, and that it seeks to empower African women to actively work for social justice in their communities through actions that entails researching, publishing, and empowering training women through empowerment in theological institutions. Piri points out that the cycle as a protest movement against any form of exclusion and discrimination and promoter of fullness of life as intended by God seeks to increase the number of women studying and teaching theology. It is for this reason that women theolo theologians have generated many well-researched articles to engage the churches and other faith communities on, on the understanding of humanity of women and the African people understanding of the church. Weighing on the, on the formation, purpose and impact of the settle, Bragalia Bam, one of its founding members, holds that the idea of the settle was not merely the creation of a safe space and a new institution and a new institution for women, but rather it was a creation of a new model of the church and the society in Africa. The round table of the circle is open and not discriminatory, she says. Bam underlines that from the onset, the circle was concerned not only as an exclusive space for Christian and church women, but for women of all religions in Africa. Ours, she says, therefore, is an expanded notion of ecumenism. What we have, therefore, she insists, is a new model, not only of the church, but also of religion and of society, she says. The mission of the circle is to serve all people of God and all members of the earth community through various faith communities of their members. The circle is thus interdenominational, ecumenical, and interreligious. Its theology is drawn from both engagement with various communities of faith as well as from various scriptures and cultures of their members. Biblically, the book of Genesis and the earthly ministry of Jesus are very important for the circle's understanding of the mission of God amongst of those, their members who subscribe to the Christian faith. What is God's purpose and intention for the earth community. In Genesis 1, God is depicted as creating the earth and everything in it within six days and resting on the seventh day. Even before the process of creation starts, Genesis 1 verses up to 2 states that the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. During the creation process, various members of the earth um, that God created, God repeatedly pronounces every stage of creation as good. Reputation, as biblical studies indicates, always denotes emphasis. If you have missed it, it is repeated 
so that you hear it again. Ultimately, in this creation story, it is pronounced that everything was created very good. Basically, all creation is sacred, interconnected, and was created good in its diversity. Genesis, therefore, presents the mission of God as the mission of dwelling in and with all creation and keeping the whole creation in its sacred goodness. All oppressions that deny the sacredness and goodness of all or any member of the earth community denies the image of God, the seal of God, and the breath of God that is in creation. The act of worship, the act of being in God's mission, is the act of working in solidarity with God, the creator, to keep all members of the earth community in their God-given dignity. The earthly ministry of Jesus is also important for understanding the mission or purpose of God for the earth. As African people, the settle and their country members experience the Christian mission carried out by Western missionaries who unfortunately in the modern history worked hand in glove with colonialism. Missionary oriented model of Christian mission is a post Easter model, which ignores that Jesus carried out a mission among his people and for his people, and that such ministry is needed even today. He preached within his country to his people, teaching, healing, and being with the marginalized. This was a difficult mission for prophets do not have respect amongst their own people. Consequently, Jesus was crucified within a year of his work. The circle embraces the mission of Jesus, which is programmatically pronounced in Luke 1, Luke 4, verses 16 up to 22. Here we are told that Jesus began his earthly mission in his own hometown by reading from prophet Isaiah, where it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord. The mission of Jesus as the mission of God is not only concerned with the restoration of broken and marginalized human beings. It is equally concerned with mending the whole creation that is proclaiming the Jubilee. The circle of concerned African women theologians with its focus on the oppressed, sick, marginalization, including the oppression of the earth, sees itself in line with God's mission for the whole creation. Be that as it may, Mark 5, which has been the most, one of the most important passages for the circle's understanding of God's mission and participation in it, will be addressed towards the end of this lecture. At this point, I want to briefly map the thematic approach of the circle. Since its inception, the circle of concerned African women theologians has had three research themes and periods for its members to explore in their various context countries, 
but also in collaboration with one another. The first research period was from 1989 to 2002. And it was characterized by building its capacity and interrogating how religions and cultures construct and empower women, as well as imagining ways of reinterpreting religions for the empowerment of women. The second research period began in 2002 to 2019. Here, the circle focused on religions, theology, and culture and HIV AIDS, as well as incapacitating faith communities for constructive response towards HIV. Given the gravity of the HIV AIDS epidemic to the African continent and its impact in particular on women and children, this theme occupied one of the longest time in the work of the sector of concerned African women and their attempt to empower the church to respond accordingly. At its recently ended Africa-wide conference of July 2019, the circle of concerned African women theologians decided to adopt the theme of religion, theology, culture, the environment, and sustainable development goals. This theme was building on the conference theme, namely Mother Africa, Mother F, and religion, theology, ethics, or philosophy. Nine volumes have been co-edited from the 29 conference proceedings. The circle of concerned African women theologian is currently preparing for Sankofa 2024 conference that will be held July um, 2024 in Ghana. The word Sankofa is drawn from a Ghanaian Adinkra symbol. It is often symbolized by a bird that stretches its neck back to its tail feathers to pick something. Sankofa symbolizes the need to reconnect with one's own history or the past to move forward. Sankofa 2024 conference is therefore a process of returning to Ghana to the place where the circle of concerned African women theologians were, was first launched in 1989 to reconnect with its mission, to assess the path it covered in the journey towards home. The research theme of Sankofa 2024 conference is globalization, environment, gender, and religion. You are all invited to attend the conference. Yet as part of the preparation to go back, to look back, the circle is un undertaking a Sankofa Act, the act of looking back and evaluating what has been achieved since 1989. Various evaluative book projects are being undertaken. These include African Women's Biblical Studies volume, which investigates and showcases methods developed by African women theologians a volume on the ethics of African women theologists, which investigates the various ethics of liberation proposed by African women in their engagement with the world and traditions of faith. A volume on creative theologies, which is a volume that uses poetry, prayers, psalms, stories, letter forms to engage major issues pertaining to women, faith, and the earth. It is also a volume that sought to engage wider members of the circle beyond the academic ones in writing and speaking. There's also three volumes that focus, from, focus on theologies that rose from different regions such as East Africa, West Africa, South, Southern Africa. 
and how they have engaged with the various faith traditions. There's a volume on F, literature and faith in the works of African women literature. This volume interrogates the ecofeminism articulated by African women creative writers. And lastly, we have two general issues on African women theologians, theologies of the diaspora. This is in preparation for the Sankofa 2024 conference. Now, seeking home, agency and power. What then is agency? How is it linked to power and powerlessness? According to Charles and Hensi, the term agency is often used interchangeably with this a similar but yet distinct concept of subject. The subject is capable of thought and critique and thus is also capable of choice and action. However, they note that the difficulty with this concept of agent and agency has to do with theorizing change, especially political and social change. If the individual is all, always subjugated to ideological and discursive constraints and all his or actions, even the ones that seem oppositional, are always accountable to the terms of those ideologies and discourses that has constructed them. How then is it possible that anything can change? Some historicists like Louis Montreux have argued that agents and their agency are both constrained and enabled by the interaction of these power structures. Consequently, while Ian Buchanan holds that agency is the degree in which a subject is able to determine the course of their actions, he also points out that Karl Marx holds that people make history, but not in conditions of their own choosing. Karl Marx, in other ways, puts suspicion in the so-called choices, as choices to do what we have already been socially constructed to choose and to do according to our class, gender, race, and ethnicity, as many studies have shown. Sis similarly, Sarah Gamage and Naila Kabe, and together with Moline Rogers, explain focusing on feminist activism, that the structure and agency, that the structure and agency are always intertwined with manifestation of power. They point out that feminists from all disciplines locate agency in the context of structural constraints. In her famed article, Can the Subaltern Speak? Gayatri Spivak argues that the subaltern, for the subaltern, the agency to speak and to be heard can only occur at the expense of self annihilation. In so doing, Spivak underlines the viciousness of the structures of oppression for those who seek agency. She underlines the power of constraints against agency. In the African discourse of the trickster, here the trickster, who is amongst the smallest among the world powerful animals, must do all there is in her or his power to exercise his or her agency, despite the monumental constraints of powerful structures and the dangers that come with exercising one's own agency. 
in the African trickster discourse. Therefore, exercising agency is imperative. That is, no matter how much or no amount of constraints should lead the oppressed to give up the struggle for their rightful place and rights. This makes the art of exercising agency and the effort to observe it quite complicated, for it takes various subtle forms, including hidden forms. Alice Yaffe Day has argued that agency can even be exercised in silence. Similarly, in her novel, Purple Hibiscus, Chimamanda Adichie shows us a range of agentic paradigms through her characters. Whereas Auntie Efeuma, a highly educated academic woman, and her daughter Amaka are openly articulate, resisting both patriarchy, colonial thinking, military violence, gender based violence at homes, in the churches and in cultures. Beatrice and Kambili, her daughter, seem to be the opposite. They seem to tolerate unacceptable violence at home by the man who is supposedly a God-fearing husband and father. In the name of his Christian faith, Eugenie has physically assaulted his wife and daughter in the cruelest manner, leading to many miscarriages of his wife and the hospitalization of his daughter and son all under the view of the church leaders who remain unable to counsel or induct him because he gave the church a sinful amount of money. Home for Beatrice and Kambili was a place of terror, a place of sin. But as the narrative progresses, they slowly begin to undertake resistance to Eugenius violence and imposition of his colonial Christianity that often deny them even the right to sing and pray in their indigenous languages. The concept of agency is complicated since agency is exercised within constraints of ideological, structural, and social relations of power, especially by those who are in the margins of power. In my view, for those in the margins of power, exercising power, agency, exercising agency, is in fact the art of coming home and finding it a strange and unwelcoming place. It is the art of persistently making efforts to find a space to speak and be heard, where one's voice is persistently subjugated to silence. Agency is the art of insisting on a home space that welcomes and empowers all members. But such efforts, more often than not, becomes ways of being since the powers that are, the powers that, the powers that be, are not always willing to give up power to those who need it. And thus we have heard the slogan, Aluta Continua, the struggle continues. The slogan underlines that the journey of coming home, of seeking home, of homemaking, must always be sought since this posture of being unsettled is in itself the, the refusal to settle in, a, in sinful spaces, spaces that deny our God-given agency. As I have argued elsewhere, agents, change agents bring about change within settings that obstruct them and they are also themselves transformed by this agency. Change agency is therefore a process on being a change agency means 
assuming a process of expanding empowerment through tenaciously employing various strategies at various levels, both individually and collectively, against structures that constrain women and other marginalized persons and groups in a variety of contexts. Agency is practiced in an array of forms and manifestation, such as subtle bargaining, passive resistance, outright rejection, negotiation with the enemy, and intentional moves to start a revolution, but always within constraints of structures and always to walls the quest to increase and maintain representation and empowers and empowerment for all. For founders of the circle of concerned African women theologians, exercising agency was clearly resistance against constraints of multiple forms of oppressions and insistence to speak. Bragale Bam, one of the founding members of the circle narrates, many years ago, Messi Odioye and a few of us had a dream. It was a dream that one day, church women in Africa would cease to be spoken about, spoken for, spoken at. We were tired of listening to conversation about women conversation on behalf of women, and we were tired of being talked at. And so we embarked on a struggle to change the situations, she says. Bam insists, if ever there was going to be a theology of liberation for women, women had to construct it. It would not come automatically, even from the most radical of our theologies. Be that as it may, BAM does not minimize the amount of constraints facing African women, for she points out that, I quote, the first challenge to mention here is that African women bear the brunt of all crises facing African societies and African churches. Any crisis that African nations are faced with, be it HIV, Poverty, war, violence, genocide, she says, hits women the hardest. In this sense, in Africa, she says, women are the bearers of the cross along the crucified Lord. The first challenge facing women in Africa is all the challenges facing the continent of Africa put together. This is a mammoth challenge, close quote. Given the fact that African nations are also carrying the burdens of colonialism, neocolonialism, corruption, disappointing independent governments, neoliberal economies, and global environmental crisis, African women's experience of their home spaces, both in the public and private spaces, is unsettling, necessitating an intense quest for making home and for ways of finding the road to home. Under these grave constraints, Messi Amba Odioye, the founder of the circle, invites African women not to remain nailed to the cross by the forces that silence them, but to embark on their agentic power in her poem, Dream Girl, Dream. She invites women to occupy the resurrection space, to rise from the graves of oppression that deny them their God-given humanity. The poem reads, dream, girl, dream. What's the future going to be? Dream, girl, dream. What we may become. That's what matters. What dream? Africa's dream. 
Dream of the least of the world. Permissible dreams. Dream of the other in you, turn inside out. Make the other strong and you will be strong. We shall all be strong together. Dream. Girl, dream. Be a woman and Africa will be strong. In this invitation to, to the dream space, African women are urged to embark on their own agency. They are invited to envision and work for a different future. What is the future going to be? The poem asks. What we may become, that's what matters. The poem states, with all the challenges confronting African women as tabulated above by Brigelia Baum, the poem, the poem still insists, dream, girl, dream. Be a woman and Africa will be strong. African women's dream has power, therefore, to birth new Africa. As if the challenges facing African women are not a mammoth task, Odie invites African women to take further weight. So in this dream space, where African women are invited to dream Africa's dream, their dream for the future must also carry with them dreams for the other. They are called to be in solidarity with the list of this of the world. For the poem asserts, if you make the other strong, you will be strong. We shall be strong together. One glance, the Ubuntu philosophy in this call to dream in solidarity with the other. In the Ubuntu worldview, I am, because we are. That is, we are only human through and with others. Or as Nelson Mandela once expressed it, your freedom and mine cannot be separated. Pulelinka Bula elaborates that Ubuntu's call to solidarity with the other is a call to be in solidarity with the whole creation, with all members of the creation community, including animals, plants, and inanimate members of the earth. According to Ubuntu philosophy, once humanity can only be measured by their capacity to welcome, care, and empower the other. Given Ubuntu's emphasis on recognizing and empowering the other, Dumi Mualifi argues that without Ubuntu, we cannot worship God. For Ubuntu is the expression of God's image in us. In addition to African context, African women's experiences and African philosophies, what are the other key scriptures that empower African women theologians to participate in God's mission? Above, I discuss Genesis 1 and Luke 4 and Jesus' earthly mission. At this point, I want to turn to Mark 5, which is a, a central text to the settles mission and its participation in God's mission. Mark 5 has been central to this cycle of concerned African women theologians work, inspiring many papers, articles, books, and centers. Indeed, its centrality has made it even possible to name the work of the cycle as Talita Kum Theologies. In Mark 5 story, Jesus travels to a region of Gerizim where he is met by a man who used to live by the graves. He was demon possessed and he could not even be chained for he broke all chains and hurt himself and spent time hauling day and night in the mountains and forests. When Jesus lands in the region of Gerizim, the man comes to Jesus, begging Jesus to leave him alone. 
Jesus speaks to the demons in him, asking their name, they respond, Legion. A Legion was referred to as a Roman army consisting of about 1,000 soldiers. The Legion demons begged Jesus to at least cast them into the pigs that happened to be grazing around. Jesus does, but the demon-possessed pigs run mad and drown in the sea. The formerly possessed man is seen sitting down, composed after, ex after the exorcism of Legion. In the story, the colonial occupation of people, lands, and animals is seen as a demonic, dislocating experience, one that makes the colonizers mad to hurt themselves and find their own homes strange. The story symbolically depicts the experience of colonialism as equivalent to dwelling with the dead for one's home has been taken by demonic forces of the empire. But above all, the story depicts Jesus as the one who confronts colonial oppression and whose presence brings salvation from colonial oppression. For African women who have been subjugated to various colonial powers, there is no liberation if it excludes decolonization. Jesus in Mark 5 is thus depicted as resisting the empire and liberating the colonizers from the spirit of religion. In the second part of Mark 5, we find it featuring a woman who had been sick, bleeding for 12 years, and a 12-year-old girl who was very sick. The woman had been seeking for healing in vain until she hears about Jesus, the healer, being in town. At that time, Jairus, father of the 12-year-old girl, also hears about Jesus, the healer, being in town and starts to seek Jesus on behalf of his sick daughter. The bleeding woman finds Jesus surrounded by massive crowds that decides, but decides to push from behind to touch his garment so that she may be healed silently without speaking any words. Jairus comes straight to Jesus, falls at his feet and begs Jesus to come to his house and heal his daughter. Jesus begins to walk with Jairus, but the bleeding woman, pushing from behind, touches Jesus' garment. Jesus feels the power leaving his body as the woman gets healed. Jesus stops. He searches for the woman. He finds her. He listens to her long story of searching for healing for 12 good years. And finally, Jesus declares, daughter, your faith has healed you. Jesus then proceeds to Jairus' house where the little girl had already died. He enters the room where she had lay and places, takes her hand and says to her, Talitakum, that is, little girl, I say, arise. She rises from death and comes back to life. The story is, has been celebrated by African women theologians and seen as a validation for the mission of the circle, which is seen as the mission of God. Not only does the number 12 featured for both the adult woman and the little girl represent Israelites suffering under various empires, but Jesus is again depicted as a liberator. African women who have been bleeding under various national and international structures of oppression identify the woman's desperate search for healing as such that renders her poor without delivering any healing. Yet this bleeding woman 
is also celebrated for her agency. She faced several constraints. There was a huge crowd around Jesus, but she kept on pushing. There were cultural and religious beliefs that rendered her an unclean pollutant, one who should not be around the teachers, but she was determined to find healing. She faced poverty and gender constraints that did not allow her to speak to the teachers in the public, but she did not give up hope on changing her situations. She decided she's going to touch the garment of Jesus for healing, which she successfully does without asking for Jesus' approval or permission. In so doing, the woman takes responsibility for her own healing. She decided to get power from the powerful with or without their approval. She is an agent of change in the midst of various constraints. Moreover, Jesus and Jairus, who are both powerful male religious leaders, are celebrated for standing in solidarity with the bleeding woman and the dying daughter. To start with, Je Jesus could have walked on with, uh, with Jairus even when he felt someone had touched his, has taken his power, but he stopped and search for her. In so doing, Jesus brings her from behind where she was silent and gives her the space to tell her story. He gives her the right to break the silence, to speak and to be heard. Jesus could have been angry with the woman for taking power from her without asking, but he congratulates her saying, daughter, your faith has made you whole. In the context of where the lives of little girls did not matter due to their gender, both Jairus and Jesus are noted for their solidarity with the sick woman and daughter. Jairus seeks Jesus and begs Jesus to come and heal the daughter. Jesus accompanies Jairus to his house. He finds the daughter dead, which now rendered her body a pollutant to a Jewish teacher. But Jesus still took her hand and called her to rise from death and to come to life. The circle of concerned African women see Jesus' mission as a mission to allow women to be agents of their own empowerment, as well as to call those who have been locked in various forces of death to arise. Talita Kum, little girl. I say, arise. I want to close by saying, coming home to God's beautiful home. In conclusion, for the circle of concerned African women theologians, expression of one's agency is the act of being in the mission of God, of working out God's purpose on and in and with the earth community. God's purpose is to be in solidarity with the whole community. Hence, God created members of the earth community beautiful, all members of the earth community. By the virtue of the spirit of God having been in creation and remaining in creation, and since all members were created by God, they are all sacred. Sin is the act of missing God's purpose in creation. Sin is manifest when some members of the earth community are marginalized, denied their beauty, denied their interconnectedness, denied their sacredness. Sin takes the forms of oppression in the forms of marginalizing and disempowering the other on the basis of social categories such as gender, race, class, religion, sexuality, ethnicity. Home as the place where God invited and placed us then becomes strange, for we then experience ourselves as unwelcome. 
This is when the earth resources are plundered by economic greed expressed in such structural forces as colonialism, neo-colonialism, capitalism, and neoliberalism. The earth is plundered, exploited, polluted, and taken out of its interconnectedness and beauty. We are all witnesses that sin has been wet upon Mother Earth and rendered Earth as a strange home to us, characterized by climate change, global warming, floods, droughts, snowstorms, melting icebergs, rising seas, raging wildfires, sinking islands and cities, villages, among many, as we speak, many have no homes due to these changes. Earth has become a strange home for us because much sin has been worked against God's mission for creating the earth sacred, beautiful, and interconnected. Yes, the path of sin has been too long, and we have tread on it for too long. Now, we are coming home in full repentance. Full repentance entails embracing our God-given sacredness to assume the solidarity of God in keeping with the earth and everything in it good. It is the call to hearken to Jesus calling us to rise from the forces of death, which makes home strange, and the call to make our way towards home that God desires for all members of the earth community. Coming home and embracing God's, embracing God's mission is knowing that the good news of Jesus Christ seeks to change the situation of the marginalized and the oppressed since it is not God's will for any people to be oppressed. These good news are not only meant for people, it is good news for the earth itself and all members of the earth. It must observe the jubilee of the land as Jesus pronounced it in Luke 4. Once more, singing that hymn that I used to sing at high school, coming home, coming home, never more to Rome, is the refusal to occupy the space of sin and being sinned against. It is the courage to assume urgency in the midst of insurmountable constraints. It is to rise from the dead, to live in the resurrection power against powers that nail us to the cross. Yes. It is to hear Jesus saying, Talita kum, little girl, I say, arise. Thank you.